You know, one aspect of the Lewis and Clark expedition that, in my opinion, is often overlooked is the fact that much of their success largely hinged on the good graces of the various indigenous peoples on whose land they were crossing. Today, we'll take a look at several such encounters, first with the Odo and Missouri tribes, then the Yankton, the Rikara, and finally, a near-disastrous confrontation with the Lakota, one that had the potential of greatly altering history as we know it. We'll also examine whether or not the Corps of Discovery met with the great Daniel Boone. We'll take a look at their time among the Mandan, as well as introducing a young girl who turned out to be one of the most valuable members of the expedition, a teenaged mother known as Sacagawea. Or is it Sacagawea? How the hell do you pronounce her name? And was she really Shoshone? We're going to discuss that too. We got a lot of ground to cover, so let's just get right down to it. My name's Josh, and this is the Wild West Extravaganza. Believe it or not, the Lewis and Clark expedition was nearly over before it even really got started. On May 23rd, 1804, just two days after leaving St. Charles, Captain Meriwether Lewis was walking along the river bank when he slipped off a rock overhang and nearly plunged 300 feet to his death. As it were, he was able to catch himself, quote, with the assistance of his knife, end quote, and climb back to safety. I wish I knew more about what happened, but that's literally all that we know that he caught himself with the assistance of his knife. Hell, Lewis doesn't even mention it at all in his journal, and Clark only devoted two sentences to the entire ordeal. This lack of information would be a frustrating reoccurrence throughout the entire expedition, and especially the following day when they paid a visit to Boone's Settlement. Founded in 1799 by the great Daniel Boone himself, Boone's Settlement was a small community of Kentuckians living in present-day St. Charles County, Missouri. If I'm not mistaken, this would have been around where the town of Defiance now stands, but I could be wrong. Double check me on that one. Although the Corps of Discovery did come ashore, there is no record of them actually meeting the legendary Daniel Boone. You'd think that if they did, someone would have mentioned it, but alas, there is no record in existence. At that time, Boone would have been around 70 years of age, and to this day, there are rumors that he had, at some point, made it all the way west to the Yellowstone River. Not sure how true these stories are, but one would assume that a fledgling explorer like Meriwether Lewis would, at very least, want to pay his respects. Who knows, maybe Boone just wasn't home that day. As the expedition departed and continued to push on up the Missouri, they began to learn just how daunting of a task it was moving against the current, especially in an extremely heavy and hard-to-maneuver keelboat. Hell, the men would oftentimes have to scurry from one side of the vessel to the other just to redistribute weight as they dodged floating logs, sandbars, and other such obstacles. Then there was the manual labor aspect, you know, the constant rowing or towing that it took to muscle several tons upriver. And if all that wasn't bad enough, they soon found themselves under attack from a variety of insects, up to and including ticks, gnats, and the ever-present mosquitoes, or skeeters as Captain Clark liked to call them. Tossed in the murky waters of the Missouri, along with a diet lacking any semblance of fresh produce, and these brave explorers soon began suffering greatly from a combination of dysentery and skin boils. Still, though, they pushed on, and by June 26, had made it into present-day Kansas, where the captains had to deal with their first serious case of insubordination. It seems the two of the men on sentry duty, Hugh Hall and John Collins, had broken into one of the whiskey barrels for a little midnight toot a grave crime that saw him court-martialed and flogged. Luckily, they would later find their way back into the captain's good graces, much like Coulter and Shields back at Camp Dubois, and before it was all said and done, both Collins and Hall would eventually have creeks out west named after them. On the 4th of July, somewhere in present-day Atchison County, Kansas, Joseph Field got bit by a snake as the rest of the men celebrated the nation's 28th birthday. Thankfully, Field would survive, and he and everybody else got an extra ration of whiskey that evening. You know, for America. About a week later, right around the same time that the Corps of Discovery eased into present-day Nebraska, Private Alexander Willard fell asleep while on sentry duty, earning himself a hundred lashes to the back while doing so, well laid on. Unlike Hall and Collins, Willard would not redeem himself, and he would end up getting sent back home later that fall with the French boatman. Now, there ain't no two ways about it. A hundred lashes is a pretty serious punishment. Men have died from far less. But then again, men have also died from falling asleep while on sentry duty, 
they and all of their companions. And yeah, as the expedition continued upriver, they just kind of fell into a routine. Each evening, Sergeant Ordway would dole out individual rations of either salt pork and flour or lard and hominy. There'd be no time to cook during the day, so they'd do so at night, eating about half and saving a portion for the next morning. Of course, this was all being supplemented as much as possible with fresh meat. George Drewer and a few of the others went out hunting each day, and when successful, the wild game they brought in replaced the salt pork and hominy. And as crazy as it sounds, they began meeting fellow white men headed downriver. The first bunch, a trio of trappers, had spent the previous year collecting fur on the upper Missouri. Four days later, they ran into another party led by an older Frenchman named Pierre Dorian. Apparently, Mr. Dorian had been living among the Yankton people, married into the tribe, and was fluent in their language. As such, the captains persuaded Dorian to accompany them further upriver as an additional interpreter. By early August, the expedition made its way to where Council Bluff, Iowa now stands, and it's there where they met with representatives of the Odo and Missouri tribes, the very first natives that they encountered since leaving St. Charles. After exchanging pleasantries, Captain Lewis gifted the warriors a bit of tobacco, flour, and pork, and they, in return, graced the expedition with a whole passel of watermelons. It's my humble opinion that the Corps of Discovery got the better of that deal. I do love me some watermelons. The next day, even more Odo and Missouri arrived, and once again, the captains handed out presents. This time, an entire bale worth of blankets, cloth, and various trinkets. The U.S. flag was ran up a pole as the sergeants led the men through a dress parade, just putting on a show for the natives. This spectacle was followed up by Lewis delivering what would come to be known as his standard speech, explaining that he was sent by the great chief of America and that the land where they stood now belonged to the United States. Furthermore, all of those who lived on said land, i.e. the Odo and Missouri, were bound to obey the commands of the great chief, President Jefferson. In return, they could look to him as a father, one who would protect them and grant favors, and that he, Meriwether Lewis, had been sent by the chief to bring peace among the indigenous. This was followed by a threat as Lewis warned the Odo of Missouri that if they failed to follow the rules, if they harmed any Americans or brought displeasure to the great chief in the east, they'd be consumed as the fire consumes the grass of the prairie. What's more, no longer would traitors grace them with their presence and they'd be forced to do without European goods, especially much-needed rifles and gunpowder. Once Lewis was finished, more presents were exchanged, but it weren't much. A few medals, a little bit of paint, maybe a comb or two, stuff like that. The following day, as the expedition traveled upriver, Private Moses Reed told the captains that he had left his knife at the council site and asked if he could go back and retrieve it. Permission was granted, and Reed set out at once. Only problem was, he never returned. A few days later, correctly fearing that Reed had deserted, Lewis sent Drewer and three others in pursuit, adding that if Reed resisted, then to just go ahead and kill him. All total, Drewer and the small posse were gone ten days, but sure enough, they returned with Reed in tow, alive, along with Little Thief, the main leader of the Odo. Now, Little Thief had not been present during the meeting at Council Bluff. He had been out hunting buffalo at the time, but he was eager to speak with the captains and hopefully get his hands on a few trade goods. Lewis repeated the same speech he had given a week prior, along with an invitation for Little Thief to travel to Washington, D.C. come springtime. As if Washington wasn't already full of enough thieves. All jokes aside, ultimately this was not a successful meeting. As would tend to be the case with many other soon-to-be-encountered tribes, Little Thief and his companions wanted more than Lewis was willing or able to offer, namely guns and whiskey. The Odo were not a large tribe, and like many other tribes, had recently been decimated by the smallpox. What's more, they were constantly being raided by their enemies, the Omaha. That's where the need for rifles and gunpowder came into play. Failing to secure such arms from the captains, Little Thief then asked if Lewis could broker a peace between them and the Omaha, but this too was denied mostly due to time constraints, but I don't really think that was all there was to it. The sad reality is that the Odo were, as far as the purposes of the Corps of Discovery were concerned, a somewhat insignificant tribe. Had they wielded as much influence and power as, say, the Lakota or the Mandan, I do think Lewis would have tried a little harder to bring them and the Omaha together. Remember, one of the objectives of the expedition was to form alliances with the various tribes, and if at all possible, mediate a peace between warring factions. 
The Odo in Missouri were the first natives that the Corps of Discovery encountered, and already they were off to a less than stellar start. As for the deserter, Private Reed, he was tried, found guilty, and then made to run the gauntlet four times as other members of the expedition struck him with switches. Now, I know to some of you freaks out there that sounds like a fun time, but I can assure you that the men of the Corps were not dressed up like village people, and them switches weren't padded with leather. Much like Willard, Reed was then stripped of his rifle, relegated to the French boatman, and I imagine forced to quickly memorize the lyrics of Alouette, Jean Alouette. Interesting side note, but upon witnessing Reed's punishment, Little Thief of the Odo petitioned for his pardon. This would not be the last time that a Native American was appalled by the strange behavior of these white men. On August 20th, 1804, not long after parting ways with Little Thief, Sergeant Charles Floyd unexpectedly passed away. The just 21-year-old Floyd had been feeling under the weather for several days and was diagnosed with what Lewis called bilious colic, or in layman's terms, a bellyache. As it turns out, that was not entirely accurate, and most modern-day historians believe that Floyd was instead suffering from a ruptured appendix. As it were, the young soldier was buried on a bluff that the captains named in his honor, which I believe is now within the city limits of Sioux City, Iowa. The first U.S. soldier, by the way, to ever die west of the Mississippi River. A few days after his death, Patrick Gass was elected as Floyd's replacement and promoted to the rank of sergeant. Fun fact! Sergeant Gass would be the longest living member of the Corps of Discovery, passing away in 1870 at the ripe old age of 98. But you would already know that if you were subscribed to the 100% free Wild West Extravaganza newsletter. Head over there directly at wildwestjosh.substack.com or just head on over to my website wildwestextra.com and hit that newsletter tab up on the top. Like I said, it is 100% free. Following the expedition, Gas would remain in the military for a few more years, losing an eye in the War of 1812, and then going on to become a skilled laborer. Sergeant Gas wouldn't get married until the age of 60 when he eloped with a 20-year-old. Yes, you heard that correctly, a 20-year-old. Legend has it that Gas was then hospitalized for a short period after nearly being high-fived to death by all of his buddies. Despite his advanced age, Patrick Gas and his young bride would have seven children. And when the Civil War broke out, a nearly 90-year-old Gas attempted to enlist. Like I said, this is the kind of content that you'll have delivered straight to your inbox, but you gotta sign up for the Wild West Extravaganza newsletter. wildwestjosh.substack.com One of the more recent editions I sent out discussed a tragedy involving a soldier with the 7th Cavalry and his much-beloved wife. It's a sad story, but I think you'll find it interesting. All right, enough about that. Back to Lewis and Clark. By August 27th, as the expedition wound its way through what's now South Dakota, they made contact with the Yankton Sioux. Captain Lewis gave a similar speech as the one directed to the Odo, and much like the Odo, the Yankton wanted more presents than the Corps of Discovery could afford to give. During this underwhelming council, one of the Yankton chiefs warned the captains that their Teton or Lakota brethren wouldn't be as welcoming as they were. Now, I didn't mention this a moment ago, but just a day before the expedition met with the Yankton, Private George Shannon, the youngest member of the Corps, had gone missing. Apparently, he had taken one of the horses out looking for buffalo and never came back. That's another thing. The Corps of Discovery did initially begin the expedition with horses, at least two of them. And these two horses seemed to have been used strictly for hunting purposes. Now, the captain sent out John Coulter and George Drewer looking for Shannon, but they both returned empty-handed. Unlike with Reed, there doesn't seem to be any suspicion that Private Shannon had deserted, simply that he had either lost his way or otherwise gotten himself into a pickle. All total, Shannon would spend over two weeks on his own, living mostly off of berries and rabbits. He had lost the horse, so he was on foot and assumed that the expedition had left him behind. That being the case, Shannon was rushing on ahead upriver as fast as he could while his buddies were still behind searching for him. Finally, on September 11th, a half-starved Shannon just gave up and sat down on the banks of the Missouri, hoping to run across some French trappers headed downriver. And it's there the expedition finally found him. Skip ahead to the 24th of September, not far from present-day Pierre, South Dakota, and the Corps of Discovery lost the remaining horse to the Lakota. Apparently, John Coulter had taken it out hunting, and while he was in the process of hanging up some elk that he had just killed, some young warriors simply made off with the pony. These were the so-called Teton Sioux, the brule band of the Lakota that the captains had been warned about. 
Now, those warriors who took Coulter's horse were told, in no uncertain terms, that the explorers were not afraid to fight if need be. Then, in a much more diplomatic maneuver, the captains told a little white lie and said that the horse was actually a gift for their chief. The following morning, there was a large council between the Lakota and the Corps of Discovery, and, well, let's just say things did not go as planned. For some unknown reason, the captains had left Old Man Dorian behind with the Yankton, so Lewis was struggling to make his words understood to the Lakota. Although Drewers spoke sign, he was also having difficulty conveying the captain's intent. Another member of the expedition, Private Cruzette, was part Omaha and knew a few words of Lakota, but it weren't nearly enough. In the end, Lewis cut his speech short and just put on a show, having the men march around in formation before demonstrating that fancy air rifle. Then came the presents consisted mostly of medals and hats and coats and various other cheap trade goods. Imagine Lewis and Clark surprised when the Lakota leaders looked at these meager offerings and asked something along the lines of, That's it? That's all you've got? Looking to smooth things over, they invited a few of the chiefs onto the kill boat and gave them each a shot of who hit John. Unfortunately, this gesture didn't do much to change the disposition of the Lakota. And truth be told, at cooler heads not prevail, there's a damn good chance that this encounter would have drastically altered history. When the chiefs refused to leave the kill boat, Captain Clark and several of the men had to force them onto one of the P-Rows. Once on shore, the Lakota grabbed a hold of the canoe and demanded more presence before they'd permit the expedition to continue on upriver. Clark refused, and one of the chiefs began dressing him down, questioning the lineage of his mother and calling him all sorts of names that don't necessarily take an interpreter to get the gist of. Finally, feeling personally insulted, Captain Clark drew his sword and ordered the men to ready their muskets. Back on the kill boat, Lewis did the same while also priming the cannon. Likewise, the Lakota on shore began to string their bows and notch arrows. To all involved, it seemed as if disaster was imminent. To quote the great Stephen Ambrose... It was a dramatic moment. Had Lewis cried fire and touched his lighted taper to the fuse of the swivel gun, the whole history of North America might have been changed. Here's one possible scenario. The cannon roared, spitting out 16 musket balls. The blunderbusses roared, spitting out buckshot. The muskets roared, spitting out aimed lead bullets. Sioux warriors were mowed down in the dozens, but there were still hundreds of warriors on the bank. And even as the smoke lifted, they filled the air with arrows and kept them coming for they could reload and fire at a much faster pace than the American soldiers. Lewis and Clark, prime targets, went down. With the captains incapacitated or dead, Sergeant Ordway rallied the survivors, got to the kill boat and pushed off and retreated downriver. In short, had that cannon fired, there might have been no Lewis and Clark expedition. The exploration of the Missouri River country and Oregon would have had to have been done by others at a latter time. Meanwhile, the Sioux would have been implacable enemies of the Americans and in possession of the biggest arsenal on the Great Plains. For some time to come, they would have had the numbers and the weapons to turn back any expedition the United States could send up the Missouri. They would have increased their trade with the British Northwest Company coming out of Canada. In the War of 1812, they would have been British allies, perhaps strong enough to wrest Upper Louisiana away from the Americans and make it part of Canada. Improbable? Certainly. Impossible? Almost certainly. But still, aside from the possible long-range consequences, the confrontation on the riverbank was threatening to make it impossible for Lewis to carry out his orders with regard to the Sioux, to make a good impression on them and to make them into friends of the United States. This was the moment Jefferson had in mind when he told Lewis in his formal orders to exercise caution. If Lewis recalled that order, he ignored it. He refused to back down and continued to hold the lighted taper over the swivel gun. Nor would Clark decline combat. He kept his sword out of its scabbard. Their blood was up. They were Virginia gentlemen who had been challenged. They were ready to fight. End quote. Thankfully, right at that crucial moment, a Lakota chief known as Black Buffalo intervened, and Clark was able to once again retain control of the P-Rogue and make his way back to the keelboat. Now, believe it or not, despite this close brush with disaster, the Corps of Discovery would remain near the Lakota for another few days. Black Buffalo ended up sleeping on the keelboat that night, and the following day, they traveled some five miles upriver to his village. The Lakota warriors had just made a successful raid upon the Omaha, so they put on a scalp dance for the captains. They also had several Omaha prisoners with whom Private Cruzette was able to speak with. From them, he learned that the Lakota were secretly planning on ambushing and robbing the expedition as soon as they let their guard down. 
The following evening, with everybody on high alert, yet another tense situation erupted that once more could have easily saw the end of the expedition. As Clark was in a pirogue headed back to the keel boat, one of its anchor cables snapped, causing the larger vessel to begin to swing about in the water. As the men hollered and ran around frantically trying to gain control of the boat, the warriors on shore grew understandably nervous and one of the chiefs began yelling that the Omaha were attacking. At the same time, Captain Lewis thought that the chief was ordering an attack on the kill boat, so he began calling his own men to arms. Once again, this could have gone very badly. Thankfully, both parties soon realized it was all a misunderstanding, and it wasn't long before the warriors called it a night and returned to their lodges. The next morning, as the Corps of Discovery prepared to move on, here comes Black Buffalo, again, with a large force of warriors, urging the captains to stick around for a while. As they were talking, several more Lakota, all heavily armed, under the leadership of a chief known as the Partisan, grabbed a hold of the killboat's bowline, as Black Buffalo explained that, at the very least, his men would require a little more tobacco before permitting the expedition to proceed. Oh boy, here we go again. This time it was Captain Clark who made a show of preparing the cannon, while at the same time angrily throwing out a twist of tobacco at the warrior's feet. Lewis did the same while warning that he and his men did not care to be trifled with. Finally, Black Buffalo intervened yet again and took the bowline from the warriors on shore and the killboat was able to cast off, once more pushing up the Great Missouri River. Later, Captain Lewis would report to President Jefferson that the Lakota were, quote, the vilest miscreants of the savage race, end quote. So all in all, not a great first impression. Out of all the nations residing along the Missouri, the Lakota were not only the most powerful, but the main tribe that Jefferson was hoping to bring under American control. On that account, the Corps of Discovery had failed, horribly. And in the meantime, at least, any idea of an alliance was completely out of the question. Now, just for some historical context, keep in mind, first of all, when discussing any of these encounters between the Corps of Discovery and Native Americans, we only have one side of the story. All we know is what the men of the expedition recorded in their journals. And to quote historian James Ronda, Lewis and Clark, at this moment in time there on the Missouri River, were mere bit players in a drama larger and longer than they themselves understood. As far as the Lakota, as I mentioned earlier, they were at war with the Omaha. They had recently conducted a successful raid and were expecting a counterattack in return. In other words, the Lakota were a little on edge. For all they knew, their enemies, the Omaha, had sent Lewis and Clark in as some type of distraction. Also, this next part applies not just to the Lakota, but all the other tribes that the expedition were meeting as well. The only white people they were used to, the only ones they had ever had contact with, were traders. Now here comes the Corps of Discovery with an entire boatload of trade goods, more than anybody had ever seen, but for some reason they seemed hesitant to trade. Instead, just passing out what the natives considered cheap or meager presents. Rather than give the Lakota what they wanted, the captains just made speeches. Sure, Lewis tried to explain that their mission was a bit different and they'd need the bulk of their supplies to finish the journey, but there was a language barrier. How much either side truly understood of what was being said is unknown. And besides, if the Lakota really did understand what the Corps of Discovery was trying to accomplish, there's a good chance they would have been even more hostile. After all, in 1804, it was they, the Lakota, who controlled much of the trade on the Missouri, at least that part of the river, and I doubt they would much appreciate the Americans trying to cut in as the middlemen. And then, of course, there was the usual tribal politics at play. Black Buffalo was not the only leader present. I mentioned a guy a moment ago known as the Partisan, and there was yet another chief they called Buffalo Medicine. All of these guys were vying for influence among their people, and neither Lewis nor Clark had any way of understanding the intricacies of such power struggles. Things could have gone much worse for the expedition, sure, but it also could have been a whole hell of a lot better. In the end, like I said a minute ago, any idea of a U.S.-Lakota alliance was now pretty much unimaginable. But the show must go on, right? The next stop for the Corps of Discovery was John Vale's trading post in what's now central South Dakota, not far north of where the Cheyenne River meets the Missouri. Now, Vale was a French trader, and he was the one I hinted at earlier who had been all the way west to the Black Hills. I'm only bringing this up as a reminder that while the men of the expedition may have been the first Americans that many of these tribes encountered, they were not the first white people. This exposure to Europeans was made abundantly clear as they passed through the ruins of several abandoned Rikara villages that had been ravaged by disease. 
Over the span of several years, the Rikara had tragically been reduced to one-fifth of its population due to a series of smallpox outbreaks. If Lewis and Clark would have come through just a year earlier, they'd have encountered 18 thriving villages where, by October of 1804, just three remained. This is the same tribe, by the way, that would attack Ashley and his 100 as they traveled upriver nearly two decades later. A fight dramatized in 2015's The Revenant, starring Leonardo DiCaprio. If you're interested, I do discuss that battle more in depth on the episode I did covering Hugh Glass, as well as part one of the Jim Bridger series. Links down below for both. Thankfully for the men of the Lewis and Clark expedition, the Rickero were not yet hostile, at least not towards them. And this may have been partly due to the presence of friendly traders Joseph Gravelines and Pierre Tabou, who were able to introduce the captains to the proper chiefs. What followed was a pretty typical exhibition of the sort that the Corps had already put on for the Yodo and Yankton and attempted to put on for the Lakota. Lewis met with several of the Rickera leaders and, following a smoke, they began exchanging presents. This was followed by his trademark speech, which included urging the Rickera to make peace with their neighbors to the north, the Mandan. Then came the real fun as the mounted cannon was fired three times and Merriweather produced the air rifle. After this display of strength came even more presents, an entire bell worth of clothing, glass beads, combs, knives, tomahawks, baubles, widgets, boofaraws, geegaws, you name it. Hell, the chiefs were even offered a little bit of whiskey, but they rebuked the captains for trying to give them something that would make them act a fool. Then, later on that evening, it was time for the rank and file members of the Corps of Discovery to have a little fun as well. Once again, per Lewis biographer Stephen Ambrose, quote, the soldiers, meanwhile, enjoyed the favors of the Rickera women, often encouraged to do so by the husbands who believed that they would catch some of the power of the white men from such intercourse transmitted to them through their wives. End quote. Even Clark Slave York joined in on the festivities. Likely the first black man that the Rickera had ever seen, they considered York to be quote unquote big medicine, and as such, he was offered several women of his own. Hell, in one instance, a husband even guarded the entrance of his lodge so that York could get busy with his wife uninterrupted. Now, I've joked in the past that the Corps of Discovery essentially just screwed their way to the West Coast and back, but I'm only partially joking. They would enjoy similar relations with many other tribes throughout the entirety of the journey, both spreading and receiving sexually transmitted infections the entire way. I touched on this earlier, but damn near every member of the expedition had syphilis at some point, and you got to imagine that they also left behind quite a few fatherless children in their wake. Neither one of the captains, being the officers and gentlemen that they were, would ever admit to bumping and grinding with the indigenous, but come on. They were young men in the prime of their lives, and I kind of find it hard to believe that they wouldn't do a little partaking. Also, unverified rumors do abound of both men, Lewis and Clark, siring children among the natives. Most notably, a Nez Perce by the name of Daytime Smoke, who, as an older man, would end up taking part in the Nez Perce War, surrendering with Chief Joseph, and later dying in exile in Oklahoma. And just one last thing about these sexual encounters, you gotta remember, they were transactional in nature. Whether it be a husband offering his wife as a way of receiving quote-unquote medicine, or simply one of the members of the expedition trading a handful of beads for a roll in the hay, the women involved likely had very little choice in the matter. They, just like York, were, unfortunately, considered property. Now, as the Corps of Discovery was still there among the Rickera, Private John Newman came down with a pretty serious case of insubordination. To this day, nobody knows exactly what he did, other than uttering, quote, repeated expressions of a highly criminal and mutinous nature, end quote. And as a result, he got himself court-martialed along with 75 lashes. And just an FYI, but these were not punishments that Lewis and Clark just doled out all willy-nilly like. Newman, just like everyone else who got disciplined, was tried by a panel of two sergeants and eight privates, his peers. It was they who decided on whether the offending party was guilty, and it was they who decided the punishment. One of the Rickera chiefs, while witnessing Newman's flogging, yelled out in distress and begged for mercy on the private's behalf. When the captains explained their reasoning, the chief said that he too thought making such examples was necessary, but the only difference was when he did it, he did so through death, not a whipping. Among the Rickera, they wouldn't even whip their own children. I guess the idea is that it's better to die than to live with a broken spirit. Now, although Newman would not be allowed to finish the expedition, 
he'd be sent back home the following spring with the kill boat, he did somewhat redeem himself. As soon as his back healed up, he did his best to pitch in and was an active contributor on the journey home with the kill boat. While the captains refused to restore Newman as a full member, according to Lewis, quote, he stood acquitted in my mind, end quote. And like many others, Newman would receive a land grant for his service. Also, like some of the other veterans of the Corps of Discovery, Newman would, in the years to come, return west and trap for beaver. Or at least he would before being slain by the Lakota in 1838. From the Rickera, the expedition pushed up river until, on October 26, 1804, when they finally arrived at the villages of the Mandan, about 40 or so miles north of present-day Bismarck. It had been a total of five months and five days since they departed St. Charles. And they'd spend another five months right there with the Mandan, waiting out the winter and preparing for the next leg of their journey. Now, the Mandan were major players in the trade economy of the West. While they did primarily live off of buffalo when the hunt was good, they also practiced farming. That being the case, during the summer months, the Mandan villages were considered a hub of trade as other tribes and European traders visited from far and wide looking to do business. The French Canadians and the British also maintained a strong presence among the Mandan and had for quite some time. Sadly, like most other tribes, the Mandan would suffer greatly from smallpox in the latter part of the 18th century, and by the time Lewis and Clark arrived, the population had plummeted from an estimated 10 to 15,000 to just around 3,600. Nevertheless, the Mandan, along with their allies, the Hidatsa, did welcome the Corps of Discovery with open arms. The expedition's winter quarters, dubbed Fort Mandan, consisted of two rows of huts with a defensive barricade on the riverside, along with a gate and sentry post. The outer walls were nearly 20 feet tall, and according to one of the French traders living among the Mandan, the fort was, quote, made so strong as to be almost cannonball proof, end quote. And yeah, the Corps of Discovery got along well with the Mandan and the Hidatsa doing a little bit of trading while at the same time making a futile attempt at brokering a peace between them and their enemies, the Lakota and Rickera. Due to the Mandan being farmers, the men of the expedition finally, at long last, got some damn vegetables in their bellies, and truth be told, had it not been for Mandan corn, there's a possibility that the Corps would have starved to death. And this is just really one of the many examples of the expedition's survival hinging on the kindness of their native hosts. This is something we'll see time and time again throughout the course of the journey. Don't get me wrong, the Americans were hunting when they could. They even joined the Mandan on a buffalo hunt. But game was not always readily available, especially considering the estimations that each man was consuming around 5,000 calories per day. And that's 5,000 calories of extremely lean meat. By February, Private John Shields set up a forge and bellows there at the fort and began cranking out axes and iron hoes and other such tools in exchange for corn, and it's that Mandan corn that saw the men through the worst of the winter. Meanwhile, the captains soaked up as much intel as they could about the lands to the west. From the Mandan and Hadatsa, they learned of the Great Falls of the Missouri as well as the Three Forks region. They also ascertained that an all-water route was probably a no-go. Once they reached the Rocky Mountains, they would most likely need to head overland, and to do that, they were going to need horses. That's where the Shoshone came into play. After all, it was Shoshone land where the Corps of Discovery was headed, and it just so happened that the Shoshone were rumored to have plenty of horses. So yeah, really other than just trying to stay fed and questioning the Mandan and Hidatsa, the men of the expedition pretty much just spent the winter trying not to freeze their peckers off. Captain Lewis took the temperature each morning, and the recorded average for the entire winter was just 4 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the average, though, and it would dip down into the negatives more than once. I think the recorded low that year was negative 45. Good God. And a few of the men would fall prey to frostbite. Ah, but seasons change, and it weren't long before the icy Missouri began to thaw. At long last, on April 7th, 1805, the expedition set out once more. Many of the French boatmen had already headed back down river to St. Louis the previous fall, and now that the captains were headed west, it was time for the keel boat to return as well, under the leadership of Corporal Richard Warfington. Those who remained to finish out the rest of the trip were the Corps of Discovery's permanent party. You had Captain Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, obviously, three sergeants, 23 privates, Lewis's dog Seaman, Clark's slave York, and the interpreter George Drewer. 
finally, as newcomers to the expedition, there was a French-Canadian trader by the name of Toussaint Charbonneau, his wife Sacagawea, and their newborn baby, Jean-Baptiste. Now that right there is a story in and of itself. The somewhat shady Charbonneau was an independent trader out of Quebec who had been living amongst the Hadatsa for quite some time. Matter of fact, it's from the Hadatsa that he acquired his two wives, the aforementioned Sacagawea and another young lady by the name of Otter Woman. Both of these gals were Shoshone by birth, taken captive by the Hadatsa a few years earlier, and won by the middle-aged Charbonneau in a game of chance. Knowing that they'd soon come in contact with the Shoshone and hoping to obtain horses from them, the captains offered Charbonneau a job as a translator, mostly on account of his Shoshone wives. Only one of whom, by the way, would be permitted to join the expedition. For reasons unknown, Charbonneau chose the then just 15-year-old and heavily pregnant Sacagawea. She'd give birth to little Jean-Baptiste, nicknamed Pompey or Pomp for short, on February 11th, 1805 with Captain Lewis's assistance. And then, less than a month later, Sacagawea would set out west with the expedition, newborn baby in tow. And I guess the rest is history. And just real quick, let's go ahead and discuss Sacagawea's name, or more specifically, how to properly say it. Like many of you, I've always thought it was Sacagawea. Then, I don't know, maybe a decade or so ago, I started hearing people call her some variation of Sakakawea or Sakagawea. So when it came time for me to research this series, I figured it was as good a time as any to see if I couldn't finally determine the correct pronunciation. And so far as I can tell, there's not really a definitive answer. You can find Sacagawea's name written in the journals of Lewis and Clark at least 17 times and phonetically spelled eight different ways. However, not a single one of those spellings is with a J, always with what appears to be a hard G, Guh. Furthermore, according to Meriwether Lewis, her name means bird woman in Hadatsa. And in the Hadatsa language, the proper way of saying bird woman is something along the lines of Sakagawea. Not Sakagawea, Sakagawea. Okay, sounds pretty cut and dry, right? Well, not so fast. While there may be a Hadatsa phrase for bird woman that sounds like Sakagawea, the young lady in question was not Hadatsa. She was Shoshone. And the Limhai Shoshone do maintain that her name is indeed pronounced Sakajawea, just like I'm saying. According to the Shoshone, it roughly translates as boat launcher or boat pusher. Not only that, but there are others still who claim that Sakajawea's Hadatsa captors transliterated, how's that for a fancy word? They transliterated her Shoshone name, Bird Woman, into their own language and pronounced it according to their own dialect. Which, fun fact, the Hadatsa do not have any J sounds in their language. So it came out sounding like Sakagawea. Or alternate theory, according to author and supposed all-around Shoshone expert John Rees, the confusion was the result of misinterpreted sign language. Apparently, the Shoshone sign for boat pusher is very similar to the sign for bird, and that being the case, Toussaint Charbonneau erroneously told the captains that his wife's name meant bird woman. It's all very confusing. Then there's Nicholas Biddle, whose edited journals of Lewis and Clark was literally the standard for over 100 years. Before publishing his 1814 edition, Biddle took oral statements from both Captain William Clark and expedition member George Shannon, statements containing information that was not found in the original journals. And supposedly, both men claimed that Sacagawea's name was pronounced with a J, not a G. With all that in mind, if you'll indulge me, I would like to share highly respected historian James Ronda's take on the matter. According to Ronda, quote, the name of the Indian woman, its meaning and proper spelling, continues to spark considerable debate. Sacagawea, Sacagawea, and Sacagawea have all had their partisans. The concern about spelling is not just a quibble over orthography. If the woman's name was Sacagawea, the word might be Shoshone, meaning boat launcher. However, if the spelling is more properly Sacagawea, the name would be Hadatsa and translate as bird woman. The journal evidence from Lewis and Clark appears to support a Hadatsa derivation. On May 20th, 1805, Lewis wrote, and I'm just going to spell this out so you can understand what Rhonda's saying. Uh, on May 20th, 1805, Lewis wrote S-A-H space C-A-G-A-H space W-E space A-H. Okay? Sa-Kaga-We-A. Uh. 
So I'll go ahead and say that again. On May 20th, 1805, Lewis wrote, Sacagawea, or Bird Woman's River, to name what is now known as Crooked Creek in north-central Montana. The most effective argument for a Sacagawea spelling and a Hadatsa meaning are offered by Irving Anderson. Anderson summarizes the previous literature and finds that the Sacagawea spelling best fits both the historical and linguistic evidence. However, it should be noted that an unpublished paper by Bob Sandin, Sacagawea, the origin and meaning of a name, does raise important questions about the whole matter. Both Anderson and Sandin rely heavily on the findings of professional linguists, who in turn differ considerably in their conclusions. Along with the historian Donald Jackson, I, James Ronda, have found the Sacagawea spelling the most acceptable. End quote. So there you have it. I don't know if you're as confused as I am, but while it does seem like the scholar types do tend to lean more towards Sacagawea, the actual Shoshone beg to differ. They still say it's Sacagawea. And as you just heard a minute ago, there is some evidence backing up their side of the story as well. Then again, just to even further muddy the waters, there are oral stories passed down among the Hadatsa stating that Sacagawea wasn't even Shoshone. Legend has it that she was truly a Hadatsa by birth, but had spent time among the Shoshone as a child, possibly as a captive, before returning to her people, which is where Lewis and Clark picked her up. So who the hell are we even supposed to believe, right? As for me personally, for this series at least, I did choose to just go ahead with the classic Sacagawea. Not because I'm necessarily married to that particular pronunciation, but in all honesty, it does make my life a little easier. Sacagawea is the way I've always been saying her name in my head all these years, and I thought it would make the recording process a little smoother if I just stuck with what I'm used to. Also, once again, despite those oral stories among the Hadatsa, most of the evidence does point to Sacagawea being Shoshone, and modern-day Shoshone do say her name as Sacagawea. Look, in all reality, no matter how I say her name, somebody's gonna get pissed off. That much is a given. If I'm gonna err, I'd rather just go ahead and err on the side of the Shoshone. Are they 100% correct? I have no idea. Just rest assured that whether I'm using Sakagawe or Sakajui or whatever pronunciation I'm using, I am speaking of this young lady with full and utter reverence. The significance and scope of Sacagawea's contribution to the core of discovery cannot be overstated. As you'll soon hear throughout the remainder of this series, Sacagawea would end up becoming one of the most valuable members of the expedition. And that's not an exaggeration. I'll even take it a step further by stating that I'm not sure the expedition would have even been successful had it not been for Sacagawea's help. Her husband, on the other hand, Toussaint Charbonneau, whoo boy! That dude is a completely different story. Quick-tempered and next to useless on the water, the old French trader would end up being a headache more than anything else. Someone to whom Captain Lewis referred to as a man of no particular merit. But we'll get to all that soon enough. For now, I think this is a good time to go ahead and wrap things up for today. We still got a lot of ground to cover, both literally and figuratively. So please, join me next week for part three. If by happenstance you missed out on part one, Check out the link down below to hear all about the Louisiana Purchase and the Corps of Discovery's origin. Next week, we'll follow the expedition all the way to the Pacific Coast, describe quite a few harrowing encounters with pissed-off grizzly bears, and discuss the Corps' time not only among the Shoshone, but the Nez Perce and other tribes as well. And yeah, we'll probably talk about the venereal diseases some more. Why not? Till then, adios!